Uh, Elsa Olivetti is the Esther and Harold Edgerton Career Development Professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering uh, and the co-director of the Climate and Sustainability Consortium at MIT. Her research focuses on reducing the significant burden of materials production and consumption through the increased use of recycled and waste materials, informing the early stage design of new materials for effective scale up and understanding the implications of policy and new technology development and manufacturing processes on the material supply chains. Professor Olivetti received her BS degree in engineering science from the University of Virginia in 2000 and her PhD in material science and engineering from MIT in 2007. Please help me to welcome uh, Professor Olivetti. Thank you so much, Chris. Such an honor to be here and to get the discussion started. Um, what a great lineup, uh, very cool. Um, and so what I'm gonna kind of start us in off in, in talking and thinking about uh, the role of text and data mining in particular in, in materials informatics uh, and machine learning and AI and, and, and the role of that in, in materials. And I think the, the starting point to think about text and data is really about a point that I expect will be made throughout the mini conference and has been made to date is about data being a really key ingredient in machine learning, obviously, for materials. Um, and we can think about the exponential increase in the amount of information uh, that's that's come out that we need to be able to try to process and the idea that we could go about assembling that information manually uh, or or getting all the access to the data that we need in order to have machine learning models have the set of data they need we need some accelerated way of doing that or at least as a tool to to have that somehow happen autonomous autonomously on the left hand side here we see growth in the number of active peer re reviewed journals as one metric of exponential increase in content uh, a recent uh, review paper by um, the Seder group looked at the number of publications appearing every year in different fields of material science that's shown on the right hand side here and this is through manual query of web of science publications and you see that broken down in the top panel by color uh, in terms of the, the application of those materials from research articles, communications, letters, and conference proceedings. And the bottom reflects the nature of the way that information is either as in, in the form of an HTML or XML or a PDF. And this gets us sort of directly into the weeds and the challenges of, that we face in looking at text and data mining in particular that I'll get into. But the, the point of showing all this exponential growth in content, as we know, is perhaps a, a stronger motivation than just getting the data is, this, is the necessity. So we as scientists and engineers can't make the necessary connections that we need to instead across disciplines without some sort of automated way of, of doing that or informing that. You know, maybe instead our attention is gathered by who's tweeting the loudest or highlighting a particular journal. And really scientific progress depends on formulating verifiable and deductible hypotheses hypotheses. And so we need a way to try to structure this information. And we as scientists are not good at inherently encoding our findings in a format that that make, you know, using controlled terminologies, etc. So this has been really a motivation for us, not only in providing the data in the way that we need for the machine learning models, but, but this idea that we need to do so in order to advance the, the scientific uh, discipline in the in a hypothesis driven way that that we want to be able to do. So that was the motivation, at least for us. And and the talk that I the time that I'm going to talk with you all this morning is really trying to outline where I feel things are in terms of uh, natural language processing use and in, in text mining and some opportunities for using that uh, data that's drawn from that, but really where the key uh, places we need to improve in order for it to reach the scale at which I think it does need to reach in order to realize these motivations that I've offered here. I'm going to start by offering a, you know, a bit in the details. I think, you know, very quickly when you're thinking about natural language processing in its use to, to in its ability to enable us to autonomously extract information, you very quickly get into the weeds. Um, and so I just am going to illustrate a little bit of that methodologically to, to, to give a little bit of the framing of where I think the key challenges arise and where I think effort uh, really can, can be spent in order to accelerate things. Because at a high level, when we're trying to move from unstructured and semi-structured data and text that's described by free-flowing natural language and is therefore not readily interpretable by machines, 
it, the basic flow of what we needed to do is pretty similar, regardless of, of you know, what approach we're taking or what the end game is. This idea that we need to acquire content in whatever form and there are variations on that theme, challenges in the way publishers make that information available through different sorts of PIs, challenges in the way that we scrape that data uh, and, and you know, ways in which publisher content evolves over time. So that's that first box there. And then you know, most of these approaches move then to text pre-processing in some format and all sorts of ambiguities in the way we communicate as a discipline uh, manifest in challenges and, and places of loss and 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 yield etc uh, throughout throughout a, an automated pipeline you'll see just a couple there in these sort of off stoichiometric um, ways of representing information with variables etc and and so the various ways we try to tokenize and, and find those different individual ways in which words break down is, is challenging and then we move to try to classify and, and summarize text and, and break it down into the kinds of of parts of a document we need uh, that you know there are there are challenges with that in terms of the lack of con uh, uniformity or standardized terminologies in the way we do that. Um, and then we get into the, the kind of heart of the matter in terms of entity recognition of, of where we pull out individual words um, and, and how that's done in effective ways uh, is it also presents challenges and errors and in, in, in opportunities for improving our methods. And then finally, how we link various in pieces of information um, across the literature. So as I said, you know, we right away get into kind of these these what would be we would think of fairly low level challenges um, and, and but those are essential right as we have loss any sorts of losses upstream in a pipeline you know those manifest down the line and so working with the collaborators that we have in my group and uh, the collaborators that we've been working with expertise in natural language processing and in, in the form of Andrew McCallum at UMass Amherst and then obviously working with Hairbrand Sater uh, on some of the tools that we've developed around uh, the database development and links to thermochemical information who's at, at UC Berkeley. And so the, the overall goal in, in trying to, to leverage this opportunity uh, comes down into this pretty simple um, paradigm around the way we try to uh, uh, make autonomous these sorts of approaches is a semi-supervised um, method where we're using various natural language processing models to do vast unsupervised learning across corpora. Uh, and this uses a word embedding approach that we can that I'll mention some results of in a, in a little bit here and that unsupervised vast way of learning across uh, reams of, of scientific scientific information is then complemented by hopefully just a little bit of supervised classification manually labeled data, because that is a particularly expensive and another kind of challenge and opportunity that I see the material science discipline needing to put more effort into is developing uh, rules and standard operating procedures for how we do annotation, but also putting in the effort to have uh, larger sets of, of manually annotated data um, that will make sure that that we begin to, to refine and improve models across the, the heterogeneous discipline that that material science is. So this match between unsupervised word embedding models that make use of the latest uh, advances in computer science and natural language processing in order to do that unsupervised learning as effectively as we can, coupled with structured, careful way of doing more supervised classification, uh, manually labeled data, um, you know, it's, it's that combination that that makes this uh, autonomy possible um, and, and gives us the ability to try to extract information at scale. And so the the what I want to kind of mention methodologically beyond just this very high level uh, description I've given in terms of how we do natural language processing uh, is some of the areas in which I think we need to focus in order to to improve that within the material science domain. So I mentioned already, uh, you know, in in that initial graphic, uh, the the challenge that we have associated with. Uh, the, the form of the text that we're pulling information from. Um, and so just to give a little bit more on that, we're somewhat time limited in terms of the, 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 the record of the corpus we can be doing automated extraction on because of the presence of uh, scanned um, PDF type documents or PDF with that's with 
that's not necessarily digitized. And so again, even though this um, you know, is hard to, to, to classify as a, as a sexy or interesting research problem, it's really an important area for us to make advances in, in order to be able to get the full archive of, of information as part of any kind of a text extracted document. The other way to think about this argument is, is that you know, we can get really good at, at doing a better job of, of publishing our data in open ways, at, at developing standardized terminology and structured ontologies for how we present material science information in order to make data, uh, you know, readily available. But that's going to be from now going forward. And there's still, you know, a vast archive, uh, and, you know, as this sort of cartoon um, illustrates from the 1990s forward, um, that gives us that digital representation of, of the field versus, you know, looking at more scanned um, OCR uh, type documents. And so there really the, the approach that we're using and, and it, where effort needs to be spent is, is in spatial um, uh, you know, tools to, to quickly spatially identify information within the text. So here's just an example of an annotation tool that, that our collaborators at UMass Amherst have been developing, you know, identifying parts of a text that are interesting, being able to quickly label those, put bounding boxes on them, and then developing text-based annotations from that. So that's, you know, again, a, an example of, of where we need to see improvement. And, and this is coupled with this uh, the call to action I would offer around developing strong, robust um, uh, annotation data sets that have really interop uh, a good interoperable, excuse me, good inter annotator agreement across them. So that's one kind of improvement that I see in one role of, of machine, of material science in, in machine learning. Uh, that would make data more accessible across the published literature. Others, another example is making really strong use of advances in entity recognition um, that has been made in the computer science field, but but putting the time and care into making that relevant to uh, machine material science context. And here we look to transformer models that have been, um, you know, the kind of latest attention based architectures that that are really helping to improve uh, entity recognition. Um, so here, uh, I've just kind of highlighted some of the uh, ways in which these these attention based transformer models, the the base model being called BERT, um, the bi bi-directional encoder uh, representation in transformers. But the idea of transformer models is that they're able to think about sequences of words, they're able to think about word pieces, and that we're able to do some, some significant pre-training uh, on the, the corpus of relevance uh, for what we're looking at. And so just a little example of the ways in which we've um, even the base models, we found some, some useful in, in, in terms of uh, transformer-based models, even in paragraph classification within a text document. And, and But the challenge with these transformer models, first, we need to be able to train them on a material science context. Second, they tend to be more computationally intensive. They tend to be more, uh, you know, take more computational resources. And so using them in a, in a tailored way, uh, you know, helps with that. So just as an example in the paragraph classification, we can use section heading information within a paper to, to develop very simple rules that tell us, are we or are we not interested in a particular part of the paper? And then we can use more advanced, either um, you know, uh, machine learning classification problems or trying to look at some of these transformer-based models. Um, and so here I'm just giving a little example of a paragraph classification for paragraphs that you know didn't effectively move through the part of the pop pipeline that we were trying to use rule-based approaches to, that if we look instead at using word embeddings and some contextual information about where things are in a document, uh, you see just a little example of results there looking at the introduction, uh, the recipe, other methods and results, where we have an example of, of accuracy metrics of F1 metrics when we're not using one of these transformer models in that mil middle column there uh, versus if we're looking at, at more transformer based models, we see an improvement um, in, in our ability to classify these. And, and we can see even further improvements um, if, you know, if we then refine these transformer models to be uh, material science specific. So there have been, uh, you know, up and coming uh, trained models looking not just at the baseline BERT, but also BERT on scientific corpora, and then even more catered towards, towards material science um, itself. 
So that's a that's another opportunity that we see where then um, this this word context improves our text mining performance. And then if we link that back to the very computationally efficient, more heuristic based approaches, we see you know in reasonable performance in our ability to classify paragraphs. And we can translate this sort of learning to the the entities themselves, the words themselves. I'm happy to talk about that more in questions. But I just wanted to make this high level point um, around the the value of using these contextual based word em embedding models. But coupled that to the computational intensity of them means that we need to try to make selective use, where maybe we as as domain experts know that you know particular kinds of classifications will be more challenging th than others. So another a key limitation that or a key opportunity for improvement um, that we found in our work has to do with what the natural language processing community calls non-local dependence. So linking data within a manuscript. Um, and you know, this, uh, this manifests in a couple of different ways. One is that when we have a, a document that talks about multiple experiments that we're running um, within a particular paper, we need to be able to make sure we're associating the right results with the right uh, experimental parameters. But, but you know, that could happen within one section of a paper. The more challenging and you know more interesting problem potentially from a natural language processing perspective is obviously our scientific uh, papers present information all across a document. So you have a compositional information in one place, processing information in another, for example, and results scattered throughout tables, figures in the body text. And so right now, uh, you know, current to date, this has mostly done through post processing activities because the information extraction tools within the natural language processing community tend to be on a local level, on a sentence level. And so anytime we're trying to link information as is sort of illustrated by my blue arrows here across the document, this is a significant uh, limitation. And so moving towards um, you know, graph based models uh, you know, that, that build uh, upon the, the overall structure in a, in a text rather than the grammatical structure within a sentence such that we can do the kind of linking that I'm illustrating here embedded within our machine learning models is, is really where we're, where we're headed. Uh, and, and I'll give just a quick example of the way in which we're thinking about that within the group. Um, I'm having a delay here. Um, there we go. Um, so this this uh, at a high level is a set of a, a two stage model that first proposes, you know, a, a, a tag that could be used to try to link this information across the text, um, and then filter that tag using a second model, giving using more document uh, level context. And so because these this image here is quite complicated or you know overly complex. Um, um, the, the way in which I would represent this kind of in prose is that we use the, the our first model to cast a very wide net and propose candidates for a set of, of ways to link information across a document, and then we would filter uh, that list based on, on, on contextual information. And in some ways, uh, you know, that's kind of looking at it as, as a filtering approach. Um, the computer science community um, has been looking most recently into developing a, a word level graphs of papers. My, um, and you know, here's an image of that where we could build a graph at a, at a, at a word level, as is shown in the, in the, in the bottom um, here. So dependencies between words and then build graphs of dependencies between sentences and then build on top of that dependencies across an entire document. Uh, and so that's that's another strategy um, that is is proving useful in trying to do this non local dependency uh, uh, address this non local dependency that I that I illustrated so. It, if before I talk a little bit about uses of this data and uses of, of text mine data in particular, I just want to summarize some of the points that I've made around where I, you know, I think the role of of uh, machine of the material scientist is in pushing forward text and data mining approaches, particularly related to natural language processing, because there's such a vast amount of information, I argue, that's continuing to 
come out in the published literature and being able to link that information um, is really important to furthering our abilities of, of ML and material science, but also this point around the historic archive and making uh, the right or making good use of that information. So the summary of the key challenges and opportunities is listed here. Um, I've said a couple of times that I think really investing time and effort into uh, annotated data sets and that feeds into an idea of, of ontology development and structured language development that I'd love to talk about in, in questions as folks are interested. Uh, I talked briefly about this um, in, in my example at the beginning, but, but the, the ambiguity in the way we sometimes communicate as a field or the presence of lots of, of uh, variations on a theme and how we talk about even compounds and formulas, so the lack of standardized terminology, again, I think is a real opportunity. Um, and then I've given a couple of examples of these, you know, low level yet really critical challenges in, in, in PDF extraction. We can also talk about public publisher access. So these problems that are maybe not as attractive to look at still really need to, to we need to put time into in order to leverage this as a, as a possibility. And then some of the points that I made a little bit later around kind of looking at multiple experiments and long non local dependencies, I think are other really critical opportunities that that we need to, to be able to to work tightly with the computer science community to try to leverage best methods, but also get them excited about the kinds of problems that, that we're looking at here. And this gra knowledge based graph development is, a, is an opportunity that that we see um, in, in looking at that, in addition to having some of these uh, latest transformer models continue to try to uh, be translated to material science domain and what can we learn about that uh, in particular. Um, I have a little kind of teaser bullet down here in the bottom. I think there are some groups, particularly uh, Jackie Cole's group in, in uh, uh, in England, looking at image tools, image extraction tools. Uh, so I think that's another really important opportunity. I know uh, Liz Holm has done some great work there that, um, but, but particularly trying to better automate extraction of images from the literature um, is, is another key opportunity. So, th so that summarizes the, the thoughts I had on the natural language processing side itself, the sort of where we need to get to in, in order to be able to leverage uh, the text um, as, as strongly as I think we need to for the reasons I motivated. I wanted to talk just briefly about some of the ways that we in which we use that data um, and kind of the boundaries of, of that. So, um, you know, there's this this first order interest that's really very vital in, in developing databases, right? Developing um, a structured information within the literature that can be really just information extraction in and of itself. And there's lots of examples throughout the material science domain of doing this for polymers, uh, for particular applications in, in magnets and superconductors and photovoltaics. Um, and then in, in, in my group and working with Herman Sater, information on processing, synthesis, and, and characterization. So any of these in and of themselves of kind of the, the text mining uh, and then production and publication of and dissemination of databases that, that would make this information um, compute operable is in and of itself a real value. But there are, of course, other ways we can then do that. So we can look to, to knowledge based uh, creation opportunities. And there's obviously a huge laundry list of things um, that's listed here. But just to, to mention a couple, I don't know if you can see with this window up here at the top, but the, the top here is this idea of, of visualizing data. So taking that data from the literature and being able to look at it comprehensively. Um, and then a whole suite of examples that we've given here around data analytics. Um, you know, looking at classification challenges, um, then moving towards more generative models. Um, as I as I go down uh, my list here, looking at representation learning. Um, you know, what can we learn in, in proximate space within a within a literature uh, in in latent space, and then. I, I talked a little bit about ontology creation and looking for trends in the field. Um, so these are diff, a, a suite of ways in which we might use again just text as extracted. Um, where we can be coupling that with experimental data, for example, um, or, uh, you know, th or theorized data or thermochemical um, computationally predicted information as needed, but even in and of itself, um, where the data are most plentiful, then we're able to to think about that, uh, even in and of itself that from a text mind approach. Um, and then just a, a, a couple of examples from the literature and in, in the way in which that that's being done right now in an ongoing basis within the within the machine learning community. And again, um, the examples that I have here kind of fall into three categories. So there's looking at applications in magnets. Um, 
in, 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 in photovoltaic materials. Uh, within my group, we've looked a, a good bit at zeolites um, that I can talk about in questions as folks have interest, but also in looking at, at biomaterials and, and, and other soft materials, there's, there's work as well. So this last column here is just the idea of we can slice each of these by particular um, applications uh, and, and and then the, the ways in which we might drive particular model development going backwards into this green um, area based on the application, based on the questions we're asking. And then that it, then in, it also informs going further back upstream and kind of how, what, how do we develop accurate models for the kinds of questions that we're developing. And in, in my group, the, the, um, the balance that we've been trying to strike is is a generalized pipeline going back to my initial thought there of you know a generalized way of, of extracting information from the text so that it can be transferable across for example the domains of these little databases that i'm showing on the left but also that we have the right level of accuracy um, in in what we're pursuing um, and so you know there, there's of course many examples that that i can talk through in in more detail i'm happy to take some of those in in questions I'll just, um, you know, within within my group, we focused uh, on inorganic uh, material synthesis as a starting point and trying to inform that uh, both from a, you know, just data based development, but also from from looking at generative models um, to try to do some predictive work as well. Um, and then the other sorts of examples that that we've spent time on, again, as I mentioned, focused work in, in zeolites in particular. Um, zeolites offer a particular opportunity when we're talking about text and data mining because the community tends to publish negative results. And of course, we all think about the challenges in using the published archive as, as being emphasized, you know, positively biased, of course, um, and, and zeolites, of course, are also still positively biased, but there is a, uh, the community tends to also publish um, when, when the material isn't crystallized or when we have uh, multiple uh, forms of a zeolite uh, framework present within a, within a result. Um, and so that offers a particular opportunity to develop methods um, that make use of that information. We looked also at, at cement production um, in a way, and that is also linked to then uh, industry-based data and how we would extract that and, and link that information to the text-based information, to the text-derived information. Alloy design um, in, in particular looking at recycled content uh, abilities there and how we might design um, alloys that that are more tolerant to recycled materials and then another opportunity that I see um, is looking at the use of text and data mining to learn about uh, challenges in manufacturing scalability and I'm just going to make a brief point uh, about that as a as a way to to think about where the opportunities are in, in text mining so across these examples we can think about extracting information you know, data for data's sake, right? How a material has been made, what are, uh, you know, different temperature conditions that have been used. But we can also look to, to learn more broadly across the literature uh, to, to identify, um, you know, what are trends, what are, uh, you know, underlying themes that we see in, in some of the, the literature towards you know, potential solutions for challenges in scale up. And I'm just going to give one example of of the of that um, as some as a potential opportunity that's beyond just text extraction, but also starts to look a little bit like knowledge creation or knowledge based development. And this schematic uh, is showing the ways in which we've started to look at that for a case of a battery uh, materials development. Um, and what we're looking for in that case in particular is leveraging the text and how information is, is cited or how examples of why scientists pursued particular routes um, um, is cited through, uh, you know, through knowledge spillovers, through links in, in citation maps, et cetera. Um, and so my example here is, is showing for battery literature. Well, we have some you know, problem that, that has been cited. In our case, we're looking at interface challenges in solid state electrolyte batteries. Um, and so using that, that challenge deriving from one particular problem and looking at the embedded document information to try to characterize that problem in a general way that we can then track how the, you know, ba basically various citation bridges looking at the not within the battery literature itself, but then also most excitingly beyond the battery literature. And so this starts to think this starts to look a little bit less like sort of search and query database development and maybe potentially more like knowledge based creation um, using using the text. 
Um, and so just to, to summarize where I think the kind of key opportunities are in how we use text uh, and data mining, I think you know the, the sort of first and foremost point I like to make is like, let's put text mining out of business. Let's let's start to codify what we're doing in the literature so that we don't need to do um, you know the, the, the kinds of challenge, we don't need to manage as carefully the kinds of challenges I've outlined. Um, and then, you know, moving from these kind of at scale search and query data based development towards more knowledge based creation, I think is quite interesting. Um, and then we, we I mentioned briefly this idea of, you know, we can look at more generative model development uh, versus, you know, basic classification sorts of problems, but there's lots of opportunities there. Uh, and then mo most recently, we've started to think about use of, of text and data mining data sets as seeds in larger experimental work streams and looking to autonomous streams as well. Great. So um, I, with that, would love to, to take some questions. Um, I uh, am obviously very reliant on the set of collaborators that we have within MIT, uh, looking with the, for the Roman group um, on the zeolite work that I mentioned, and then Stephanie Agelka on some of the machine learning, and then I mentioned our collaborators at, at Berkeley and UMA. Um, also in the zeolite work, we work with uh, ITQ over in, in Spain. So if there's time for a couple of questions, I would love to take some. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Elsa. Um, I'm not trying to be asocial. I can't unmute my own video. So, <laughs> uh, so we have some questions. Oh. Somehow Chris muted. I could take some questions here. Oh, are okay. you back? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go ahead and, and take these questions that I see in the chat. So um, how should we publish data, you know, to moving forward to facilitate data extraction? So um, I act, we've actually put a little bit of thought into that. Um, and, and if folks who have maybe seen me talk before have, have seen this example, um, but we did try to, I'm going to try to just pull it up quickly if I can find it. But um, this idea of how should we communicate as a field is something that, um, that I think is really uh, interesting. Um, so let me just share quickly here. Um, so the and you know I think you can you can a little bit. Um, this is just an example in this within synthesis paragraphs itself or within experimental paragraphs itself. But we do have a style of communicating that's past tense with passive voice um, that is actually more challenging to read than if we talked more like a recipe. Um, and so the, the example on the left is is kind of as published, although we tweak the words to, to protect a bit, um, those, uh, you know, no need to call particular paragraphs out. Um, and then we restructured that recipe on the right, um, you know, to make it look more like the ways in which we are finding you know, we found challenges in inaccurate prediction uh, and we can measure the performance of that. So the metric shown here, here the flesh concave grade level corresponds roughly to the US grade level education required to understand the text. Uh, and it's lowered, you know, substantially lower. So we've got sophomores in college on the left, eighth graders on the right. Um, and so that's a, you know, that's not only makes it that it would be easier for a non-native speaker to understand, but also much more compute operable. Um, and so, you know, we can do this sort of an activity throughout the, the, the entire body text um, to inform that um, as well. But this is just one particular example. Um, let's see here. Uh, so the, there's a question here about about foreign language. So one of the um, pioneers in natural language processing at MIT, uh, Regina Barzilay, she has a lot of work, um, particularly in 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 text and data mining or natural language processing related to Chinese documents. So it's definitely um, something that you know there is work actively across uh, multiple languages. I myself have not pursued those um, in in particular. I think would have to do with you know what languages are dominating particular disciplines, right? And in where effort was best. Um, spent. Um, so the uh, there's this question here. I think they're sort of similar, uh, maybe in spirit about kind of the what are the types of questions and what are the types of, of answers we're pulling um, from the from the text. Um, let's see here. That I'm trying to think of that we have um, done a lot of different kinds of cases in each of the things that that we've been developing, um, and I think. Um, Let's see here. Maybe I can give just an example related to if I can get this to come up here. Um, and it, and this is an older example, but I think starts to get at some of the the opportunities in in generative model development. Um, so here, what we're doing is using the um, 
recipes as extracted from the from a set of papers. Um, so across you know tens of thousands of papers, pulling out recipes for how uh, materials have been made, um, and then feeding them into an autoencoder uh, variational autoencoder model. So basically, um, you know. Uh, decompressing that space, the latent space, but then mapping the latent space to a prior distribution. And then we can sample from that prior distribution to try to uh, learn or suggest recipes for how materials could be made um, in, you know, a material that hasn't yet been made could be made. And so that what you're seeing on the right there um, is the target material that where we trained the model um, on, on the set of recipes uh, prior to when that material had been made. And so then you have an inherent validation approach um, embedded within the data that you're trying to use. Um, and so this can be, this effectively, I always say, is as a complement to, uh, you know, uh, simulation based, first principles based um, computational modeling, uh, as well as high throughput experimental approaches. And so what we found in this way is that this can be an additional way to try to screen. So, um, meaning that we would this would offer information about liter recipes that were most proximate um, to how things have been made to the past in the past potentially pointing you to more rapid ways of of synthesizing material so again not saying that um that the set of approaches proposed couldn't be done or excuse me the set of materials proposed couldn't be made but what is the most the most proximate way of doing that so hopefully that gives a good example here. Now there's suddenly more questions that I can process through. Um, oh, that's a cool question <laughs> from way about um, kind of uh, supporting conceptual design um, uh, or other materials design phases. Um, let's see. So I see different phases of the design activity in particular. So maybe one way that I can answer this question is, is effort. So we've been putting effort m more on synthesis, but now moving forward more on, on manufacturing scalability. And there I alluded to that little bit of that example in the solid state electrolyte space, where what we're trying to do is if we have a base model for, you know, how um, uh, like, for example, lithium ion batteries were made and, and can, and have scaled to production, can we use the information related to the text on that scaling? So on materials cost scaling, on um, various ways in which performance was improved over time. So you can kind of picture the full, um, you know, from uh, good enough, you know, the, the kind of the decades of the, the 40 year decades till Nobel Prize um, of the development of lithium ion batteries within the literature, can we learn some sort of translation translational information to sodium ion batteries, for example, or solid state electrolytes kinds of examples. So I think that um, that's trying to move much beyond the design of materials or the identification of, you know, what compounds would have promising properties, but can we build process flows or industrial flows of, of uh, historic ways in which materials have scaled up from lab to manufacturing and can those offer translational opportunities um, for, for materials we're trying to uh, pull together in the future or trying to scale in the future. Chris, oh, Elsa? You... Yes, please. I, I think I have control over my audio now. Excellent. <laughs> I can I can help you by uh, asking some of the questions that are that are typed in here. Um, so the next question is uh, in terms of when you use NLP to curate databases, is it possible to attribute confidence levels on the data? Yeah, no, that's a super interesting question. Um, and it's definitely possible. And the folks that we've been working with in the NLP community, um, you know, have methodologies for doing that. You can think of all the sets of information um, that you, you know, around institution, around how things are cited in the literature, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there certainly are mechanisms for doing that and a wealth of research, um, you know, behind that. I've always been very hesitant to do it in any kind of upstream kind of, um, you know, putting that kind of framing on the ways in which we extract the information. And we look at that much more in post-processing. So where there are outliers or where, you know, trends aren't the same is then to try to trace um, the pedigree um, and the provenance of those data points. I think that there are more embedded ways or endogenous ways you could look at that. I've always been hesitant <laughs> to do so in ways that kind of bake it in, so to speak. But certainly there are ways to do that. So let me, uh, so first of all, let me ask Alan, were you raising your hand because you had a question? Um, 
Hi, Dee. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just I couldn't enter a question in the Q and A, so uh, the only way I could do it is by activating my video. So, uh, Elsa, thank you. For the fantastic seminar. So, um, we we also been thinking a lot about the recipe space, but as you know, we we are not parsing the literature. We're trying to generate data ourselves. Mm -hmm. And came across with, of course, this Likron is KDL. Um, there's others. We even found cocktail recipes have their own XML mm -hmm. structure for, for procedures. Um, Nature Machine Intelligence is a very good journal that keeps asking more and more data requirements. And our mm -hmm. journal, Digital Discovery, is trying to kind of follow those footsteps. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine a future very soon where we could potentially just have people structure the data into that as a requirement? And if so, which if any format would you recommend for solicited materials? Yes, yes, and yes. And that's sort of my was my point. You know, let's let's put me out of business. I, you know, I think it I think that it starts to be a trend that 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 is more palatable. Um, you know, I think that the the discussion to have is around how do you incent people to do that, to put the time in doing it carefully. And there I think it's it's kind of along the lines of 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 how you of what you're saying you're doing is demonstrating the value of that, right? What is what opportunity are we able to take advantage of the fact if that's structured? Um, and then I would say, so this gets into the ontology discussion, which I love to have. I still feel and I that that it that an un, a structured template for recipes, so to speak, is still going to be by discipline, by method. Um, maybe there's this sort of overall structure of, of what uh, attributes would be required, and then you end up with specificity in particular domains, particularly because being as comprehensive as we would need to be across the interdisciplinary nature of the field would make it very onerous. <laughs> um, and so if we if there can be kind of a, um, a filtering strategy where you know the basic information we know you know across the discipline and, and then there would be kind of catered fields depending on what uh, method we we're we were um approaching or what discipline we were in and you can learn that right we have learned the template you know Sater's group for the solid state synthesis you know we can show what are the steps that are important what are the temperature mm -hmm. ranges roughly based on the based on the historic archive so i think it's achievable <laughs> someone needs to just um you know put the time in okay thank you uh just micro follow-up uh, would you think it will be valuable to actually call people for a workshop and then just define such a procedure collectively, have chemists, material scientists, chemical engineers, et cetera, and just get it done over two days or something? Yeah, there, I participated um, last month in an ontology workshop that, um, and maybe you were there as well, that, uh, you know, folks that are trying to do that within, beginning to do that, that Matthias Scheffler um, was leading. Oh, so okay. yes, yes, let's do it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sign me up. I, it would be probably <laughs> easier to do it. in person, right? That's one issue. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's great. Uh, it's 1015. So I think we probably need to go on even though there's still very interesting questions in the Q&A. So thanks very much, Elsa. I know you have your uh, talk to run off to. Um, and we will move on from here.